Welcome to the Love Lab Podcast, a safe place to get real about sex. Whether you're a man, woman, single, or couple, this is the show for you. Because, well, sex matters. We are your hosts, Kevin Anthony and Celine Remy. Welcome back to the Love Lab Podcast, and this is episode 41, and it is titled, How to Navigate Emotional Triggers in Relationships. Now, if you're listening in the audience, raise your hand if you've ever been emotionally triggered in a relationship. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, exactly. All, ends up. all the hands go up. <laughs> so we are excited today because our guest is someone we've referenced his work numerous times throughout the podcast, and we finally got him on the show. Yes. Today we have a special guest, and you've heard his name. It is Scott Cadamus. And Scott Cadamus is an Emmy Award winning producer of educational television and a master relationship coach. He's the founder of the Love Coach Academy. I think I met Scott, I want to say it goes back probably six or seven years, and I've taken numerous workshops from him. And one of the things that I do remember when I think of Scott is he's a master at empathy. He's got this ability to just like drop into the moment and provide empathy, which is, I think, a skill that's lacking in so many people. And it's such a breath of fresh air when you feel seen, when you feel heard. And that takes the communication to such another level. So I'm so, so excited to have Scott today and introduce this dear friend of ours and mentor and coach. And so we just want to say welcome, Scott. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin. Thank you, Celine. Beautiful introduction. (laughs) It's good to be here. You know, the other thing that I've always really appreciated about Scott's work, and I agree with you that he's a master of empathy, but he's also a master at communication. Mm -hmm. And I think that topic comes up in just about every single podcast we do because it's such an integral part of any relationship is how you communicate, right? So I imagine that some of that wisdom is going to come through uh, over the course of this interview. (laughs) Well, we'll do our best. And And of course, you know, since we're talking about how to manage our triggers, you know, everything you've already said actually is what it's all about. Because when we get triggered, which happens to all of us, uh, something happens, we get scared, uh, learning to slow down, calm our nervous system and drop into our heart to get out of the reptile reactive brain and to drop into that place where we can access empathy for ourselves as well as empathy for the other. That's really the key, you know? And so I just wanted to go right there, right off the bat. Right. That that's, that's the practice is learning. Now we'll talk about a few tools of how to do that, but we want to learn how to manage ourselves so that when we are triggered or we're in the possibility of getting triggered, we can stay in the frontal lobe. That's the forebrain which is where we access our empathy center and where we can see the big picture as opposed to getting abducted by our reptile brain, the reactive place that's kind of the back part of the brain where we only know how to fight or flight or freeze. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's awesome and perfect. And we're going to dive into more of that for sure as we go. But before we get too far ahead of ourselves, like the three of us, we're all really used to what we mean when we hear the word trigger, but maybe some people in the audience don't quite understand what we mean when we say when somebody gets triggered. So I was wondering if you could explain to somebody, what is an emotional trigger? Yeah, thank you. Well, it's when we perceive that we're being attacked or judged or criticized or blamed or shamed. Um... And often when we get triggered, uh, most of us have an initial way of reacting that is the cover for what's going on at a deeper level. So, for example, uh, some people have grown up where it's anger is their go-to. When, when something happens that they don't like or that they're uncomfortable with, they immediately get angry. Um, Other people's go-to might be to shut down and to disconnect. Some people's go-to might be to cry or feel sad. So inevitably, whatever our reaction is, 
it's a reaction to something is happening in our in our outer world that's poking us that's that's causing a reaction inside of us that we're either having a, an emotional response to or a psychological response to um, so that's how I would define being triggered and recognizing that the trigger may be first experienced as a poke um, followed by our normal kind of habitual reaction but underneath it there's a whole world to be discovered and understood what a fantastic explanation i love it the first thing that i loved was is when we perceive and what i love about this um, word that you use is that really what it tells us it's it's our own interpretation of something that is happening and I know with some of the tools that you use, and I know that from going to your workshops, there's some things where we, we talk about, I'm telling myself a story where it really helps us to see, okay, like it's starting to take responsibility. And I really loved how you said that, that, okay, this is when we perceive. So now we understand, okay, taking responsibility is essential because ultimately we are responsible for everything that we feel. Nobody can make yeah. us feel a certain way but ourselves. Um, but like, how can you tell <laughs> that, you're, that you're experiencing this emotional trigger, right? Because it is really difficult sometimes for people, they don't realize that they're going into that place because it's kind of that go-to place that you were talking about. Oh, I'm, I'm reacting with anger or defensiveness or quieting. Like, how can you tell that you shifted from that yeah. place? A lot of people <laughs> don't even realize they're in a triggered state. And yeah, just reacting. I know. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, how can we, how can we help people... Uh, realize or see when they might be uh, experiencing a trigger? So what I'm hearing is the request for how do we become conscious of what's going on within us. Yes. And anytime we want to be more conscious, we've got to slow down. Slowing down is the first step of any approach to being more conscious in our life. Uh, because what happens is if you take a look at any argument you've ever had with somebody, imagine if you watch a video of it, I can promise you that one or both people sped up. And the faster we speed up, the more unconscious we become, the more reactive we become, uh, and the more we are in our habit, our pattern of reactivity. So we got to learn to slow down. And so that's just probably every approach to this is just like, slow down, slow down. It takes slowing down to become more conscious. Two other tips. One is to start practicing noticing when you're reacting to an interpretation. Anybody who's not driving a car, we could write that down. Write it down. It's a beautiful practice. When am I in reaction to an interpretation? Because most of the time that we get triggered, we are interpreting what someone has said or done in a way that, that is causing us to react. So your tone of voice, your body language, what you did or said, I'm interpreting that as an attack or as something offensive. And the moment I react to my own interpretation, we are probably going to go into disconnect. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So slow down. Notice when do you react to your interpretations. And then if you really want to learn, where are you vulnerable? What are, who are the people and the situations where you're most vulnerable to get scared? To perceive that you're being attacked. I always like to use the analogy of Superman and Kryptonite, right? The most powerful superhero of all is probably Superman, but even Superman has Kryptonite that makes him weak. And what is Kryptonite? It's pieces of his own home planet. Our own Kryptonite is usually pieces of our past 
that when that past comes into play, we get scared, we get triggered. I call it veils of past pain. So learning how to identify what are my veils of past pain. You know, we've all had the experience where we're in a good mood. And all of a sudden, someone that we have previous painful experiences with pops into our world. We see them. We get a phone call from them. It might be an ex-wife or an ex-boyfriend or an employer or someone that triggers us. And immediately, they don't do anything. We just are aware of them. And our entire physiology, our entire perception of reality in that moment shifts from being neutral or happy into contracted and defensive. Why? Because our brain sees that person, it brings back memory of pain, veils of past pain come down, and we go into a defensive or triggered reaction. So learning what our veils of past pain are, what our um, kryptonite is, is a great way to become more self-aware. Yeah. And, you know, I always love when interviews just naturally go in the direction that you want to go, because my next question was, why do we have emotional triggers? Which is basically what you just answered, right? Where these emotional triggers come from. Um, But since you've already answered that, I was wondering maybe there might be some people out there listening to this going, Oh, I, I don't have any vowels of past pain. Like, it's all, it's all good, right? Like, I'm dealt you know, with it. I, yeah, I took care of my shit. <laughs> right? I was right. wondering if you could give maybe an example or two from the work that you've done of maybe common triggers or common causes of triggers that you tend to see regularly with people that you work with. So that way people can kind of identify because when they hear yeah. the example, they might go, oh, oh yeah, that's me. <laughs> okay, so... For everybody listening, have you ever had a situation with somebody that you are in a long-term relationship with? It can be a lover, a friend, a family member, and you walk in and you're neutral. You're in a good space. And you look at them and they look at you and they get defensive. They go, okay, what is it? What is it now? Do you all have that experience? (laughs) Right? (laughs) We all have, right? Yes. Well, that person in that moment even though you weren't saying or doing anything, you had no ill intent, no negative intention, that person, for whatever reason, saw you and they had a memory that came up of when they perceived they were being judged, blamed, shamed, criticized, criticized or attacked by you. And that memory took over the way they saw you. Mm-hmm. And likewise, maybe you've been on the other side of it where, you know, you look at somebody and you think they're looking at you funny and you get defensive. So there's a really common example. Mm -hmm. Another example um, that's a common one is our relationship to our parents. Uh, No matter how old we are, (laughs) we often perceive our parents are judging us when actually our parents are wanting to give us advice. We often experience advice from our parents as judgment because we had all those years as children and teenagers when we were establishing our own freedom of thought, our own independence, our own autonomy, that we had to push against our parents' ideas and values to discover our own. So even if we're 20, 30, 40, 50, the moment mom or dad actually is just trying to give us good advice, we get defensive and judgmental. I mean, we get defensive and here it is judgment. So there are two pretty common examples that I... Can you guys relate to those examples? Oh, yeah. I'm going to ask the audience again, raise your hand if that's happened to you. And every hand is going to go up. <laughs> yeah. you, you know what I find interesting about this example is I can totally relate to that. While being in my 20s, still noticing dynamics of the parent-child um, dynamic going on with, in the relationship with my parents. And so the first thing that I did was I realized that it was a dynamic that was going on, that had been going on for well, <laughs> decades. Um, so I brought awareness into this. And then I, I questioned myself and I was like, is this a type of relationship that I still want to nurture and have with my parents moving forward? Because it's not really serving me. And I don't think it's quite serving them. 
And for me, what it took was actually to set a hard boundary where Mm. I had to speak up and say, this is not okay with me. Um, This I accept or I'm, I'm willing to receive advice or whatever it was, but I do not wish to get any feedback or whatever. I I, I don't really remember the situation. I know it had something to do with my love life, not really having their support. Um, But I said, I, I put my foot down and I said, this is I don't want any of this. And I said, when we show up, since my family is in Europe, I don't see them physically often, but we do often, like maybe we used to do every week that we got on on Skype or Zoom or something like this. And I said, I'm only willing to show up for a weekly meeting if you are not going to you know, talk about this or give me unsolicited advice anymore. If you're not capable of doing this, we're going to take a break until you can do that. And so it was a very uncomfortable discussion, honestly, to say that to your parents. I did my own part. I set the boundary. I do think we took a little break. And then we were able to find a new way to relate. Beautiful. And I have to say that um, now I'm in my mid-30s, so it's been a while. And my mom was just here not too long ago staying with us. And I don't really have so much of those dynamics going on. My brother was here and I could see that going on. He was still stuck in the pattern of like the mm-hmm. little boy with his mom. And I was advising him on how to take a step back, how to see mom, not as mom, but as a human being. But I don't experience that anymore. So I want to say it is possible to actually not react to triggers all the time. That's a beautiful example. And, and I love how you laid out for the people listening the steps. And I kind of just want to, the steps that I heard is first you realized, I want to change my relationship with my parents. I want to change the way that they see me and that they react to me and the way I react to them. So first was the consciousness to desire to change. And then you made the request and you set a boundary um, and you had, I'm glad to hear the word discussion. You had a discussion. So they had a chance to express themselves as well. You took a little bit of space because sometimes we need to take space when we're doing things differently. And then you came back and it was a new experience. And then how perfect that your brother who didn't do those steps was able to mirror to you the difference between not having done that work and the work that you did. Beautiful. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. Thank you for this beautiful empathy. In case you didn't know what that was, all of you listening, this is empathy in action. And it felt delicious. <laughs> <laughs> well, since we're pointing out Scott's skills, I would also say, did you hear his listening skills and his repeating back skills so that we were all on the same page? It just point a few of those things out to the listeners. So, but I also want to say, you guys are making my job really easy because you're, (laughs) you're just like, you're flowing right into all the questions that I have. So my next question was, what can we do about emotional triggers? You just covered some of that, but I was wondering if there's any other advice you would have for the listeners on ways that they can help manage these emotional triggers. Yeah. That's a lot of what I teach. A lot of, uh, in my personal coaching and in the online classes that I teach, it's learning how to shift from the reactive reptile brain into the frontal lobe, the forebrain. And it's a neurological shifting of where we put our attention. Um, you know, the Dalai Lama, and I give how to do that, or a couple ways how to do it in a minute, but the Dalai Lama allowed brain researchers to hook up electrodes to his brain, and they ran all these tests on him for about 90 minutes. And they found that at all times, his synapses were entirely firing in his frontal lobe, his forebrain, the empathy center of the brain, the observer part of the brain. Even at the end of the research, they showed him photographs of Chinese soldiers burning down a Tibetan temple. And as he looked at these photographs, He wept. He wasn't stuffing his emotions. He wept. And then he said, this reminds me that we must remember to pray equally for the Chinese soldiers as well as for the Tibetan people. Mm. Now, I tell that story 
because we all are going to have in our life external circumstances that are really painful. People are going to say things to us that hurt. People are going to do things that hurt. We don't stuff our emotions. We cry. We feel the frustration, the sadness, even the anger. But we want to live in our frontal lobe where we can see the big picture, have empathy for ourselves, and have empathy for the other. And so empathy really is the key here because when we can recognize, wow, this person's making that choice because they so want to be safe. They're so longing respect. Going back to Celine's parents for a minute, they were giving advice. Clearly, if it was about your love life, it was before you married Kevin. I mean, I'm sure now <laughs> everything is not a problem there. That is correct. So, this, this, this is BK before Kevin. <laughs> and they wanted to make sure that their daughter didn't get overly involved with the wrong person until Kevin showed up, right? And they I were wanting to, yes, exactly. They were wanting to meet their value for what was best for their daughter, right? <laughs> so obviously I'm being playful there, but they're actually what's true is every choice a person makes mm -hmm. is an attempt to meet some precious need, an attempt to meet some precious value. Every choice, even crazy choices, are just are crazy or tragic strategies to meet precious needs. Mm -hmm. So the key, and this is the answer to the question, is learning how to practice maximum empathy for yourself. Again, Celine had enough empathy for herself to say, I don't like the way my parents talk to me. It, it hurts. It doesn't feel good. I want to change this. But she had enough empathy for her parents to also understand they were trying to give advice, they were trying to be supportive, and to have the discussion with her to change it. And that's what we want to do. We, we want to get out of making people enemies. We want to get out of the enemy image of, oh, he's such a jerk, she's such a bitch, he's such an asshole, right? Anytime we project that onto someone, we've made an enemy image out of them. Mm -hmm. Instead, it's like, what's the behavior or the choice that is impacting me? Which of my values or my needs are not being met by that choice? But at the same time, why is that person doing that? Which of their needs are they trying to meet? And when we can see the world in that way, which requires empathy, we create peace in our relationships and peace in the world. Uh -huh. So powerful. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm conflicting, conflicted in asking for more tools or... I think one thing, though, before we go there, one thing about what you say that is so current with our state in, in society, what I have noticed is that people have trained themselves to react instantly to whatever shows up. And I'm more specifically thinking about the news feed on their social media. Mm. And... And it translates into every areas of their lives because I see this every time when I deal with clients, in, even in our private sessions where it's kind of the default mode of always having to put off fires or, or reacting right away. And I think that this keeps us really trapped in this reptile brain that you're talking about. And... I think if we have also compassion and understanding that the way society is designed right now, it's kind of creating or giving, keeping us stuck into this reptilian area. It's, it's training us it's to be overly us. reactive. This is why the one headline is all that anybody ever reads. Mm -hmm. And you see it all the time in social media. They'll just throw a headline up there. And then people will react immediately, believe it immediately. But if you actually read the whole article, by the time you got to the end, they just disproved whatever the thing said in the, in the <laughs> title, right? Mm -hmm. This is how clickbait works. <laughs> right. So it's, what I'm hearing is the tragic, quick judgment reaction that when we are so quick to judge, which is prejudice, right? Mm. Um, and so when we have prejudice, oh, we see somebody of a different color or a different race, and we immediately prejudge them. 
And again, we as a human species are moving from survival where we did have to be quick to judge because we were in physical survival. And so our lives depended on quick reactions to protecting ourselves. Now we're moving into learning to thrive. Most of the people listening to this podcast are not in physical survival. Mm-hmm. And we are one, two, maybe three generations removed from a long ancestral lineage that was in constant physical survival, but no longer. And so we are in the age of moving from surviving to thriving, Mm -hmm. moving from quick, reactive judgment, reptile brain, into frontal lobe, what's really happening here? What's the big picture? Mm -hmm. Having empathy for the other, as well as empathy for ourself. And it's a practice, and it goes back to what we talked about before, becoming more conscious, which requires slowing down. Mm -hmm. And and that's why I said, if you really want to do this, notice when you are reacting to an interpretation. When we react to an interpretation, we react to that headline. Oh, we, we see the headline, we interpret what it really means, and we react to it. Or do we read the whole article? Do we get another point of view? Mm-hmm. You know, um, one really interesting thing I just recently learned, uh, scholars generally agree that Abraham Lincoln was the greatest president of the United States. And something that I learned is that when he was elected, he put all of his political opponents into top cabinet positions. He surrounded himself with his enemies and his political opponents because he wanted to get as many different points of view as possible, and he wanted to create a coalition. As opposed to certain political figures that if you don't agree with me, you're out, right? Mm -hmm. And so the genius of that is what Einstein said, the true measure of intelligence is how quickly can we change our beliefs? Mm-hmm. We've got to slow down, be more conscious, and go beyond the quick judgment, the quick reaction, and try and look at a bigger picture. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so <clears throat> that requires some significant work, and that yeah. requires a lot of practice. And so I'm wondering, you know, listening to this podcast is a great start, and I hope this uh, helps some people. And I'm, I'm pretty darn sure they're going to need some more practice. Yeah. So, <laughs> So I'm wondering if you could tell people how they could find out more about your work because they they will likely want some resources to help them practice this. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, so I teach online classes and I do coaching. Um, and so people can get information by going to lovecoachscott.com, lovecoachscott.com. And for anybody out there that's a coach or a therapist interested in learning my tools, go to lovecoachacademy.com. Dot com, where I train other coaches. Um, and we're all still learning this. I've been learning and studying this for a lot, my whole life, really. And it's, it's an ongoing practice. Um, you know, to master anything takes practice. But what's cool about the online classes that I teach is that they're with other people from all over the world who also want to learn the skills of emotional intelligence, skill building, and compassionate communication, neuro-linguistic programming. And we learn together in really fun and wonderful ways. Mm -hmm. And we highly recommend that. Like we said, we took several of uh, Scott's workshops uh, through the Love Coach Coach Academy. I use his work in my personal relationship. I use his work in my professional relationship. I teach some of that to my clients. I think it should be required teachings at school. We should learn that. When we start to learn the language, we should learn how to identify emotions, feelings, and needs. Um, And that's really how I start. I had printed out feelings and needs, a list that I made for myself. And that goes way, way back in my early 20s when I found a nonviolent communication um, by Marshall Rosenberg. And I, I made these lists and I printed them out. And every time I got triggered, I would go like, hold on. And I would go in front of the list and I would like scroll down until I found this is the how I feel. 
And then mm. go beyond that, what do I really need? Because the feeling is not, I mean, it's not that important. I think the need is more important. You're trying to, to get need met. And that's how I did this. And it took me several years. Now I don't need the sheets anymore. It's integrated. But check out Scott's work. <laughs> so he's always been an overachiever. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. I, I love that. And it's true. It's like, it's a practice learning how to see the world through feelings and needs as opposed to judgments and reactivity. Yes. Yeah. And that's how we create peace. Mm-hmm. Mm, I love that. And that's how people have great relationships like Kevin and Celine. <laughs> yes. Well, I do know you have a special gift for our listeners. And um, all of you listening today, there's a quick action for you because Scott is offering a free 20 minutes consultation for the first free people who apply. So I'm assuming if they go to lovecoachscott.com, there's a way to reach out to you and mention the Love Lab podcast. That, that's yeah. how they found you. And yeah, that's they, they, they can do it that way. Um, or my email address is sc. My initials, mm-hmm. sc at lovecoachscott.com. Okay. So you can send me an email or they can send me a Facebook private message. I'm the only Scott Katamas on planet Earth. So I'm pretty <laughs> easy to find. Awesome. So if you are on the fence, this is a fantastic gift and opportunity for only three of you. Take him up on his offer. You will be blown away. Even 20 minutes can start to change the course of your life. And don't forget to mention the Love Lab podcast. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> where you heard about it. <laughs> all right, everybody. That is all the time we have for this episode. I would like to thank you, Scott, for being on here with us. And we will My see you all next week. We hope you liked this episode of the Love Lab podcast. If you enjoyed this show, leave a comment and share it with your friends. And if you want more, we have an entire digital library with the best sex tips and relationship advice at CelineRemy.com. That's C-E-L-I-N-E-R-E-M-Y.com. So join us in the sex vault to continue this adventure. Thanks for listening. And remember, you're amazing.